Hey, Sari. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me on here. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you for so many reasons. Uh, but let's start with the basics. Where are you? Yeah, right now I'm I'm sitting in my home studio. We just moved. I am in Taylor, Texas, which is a little town just northeast of Austin. So Austin's still my hub and my metro, but um, yeah, I'm in Taylor, Texas right now. <laughs> That's amazing. And I have to ask you, how are things in your environment with this COVID craziness? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate in so many ways. Um, my husband and I both have jobs that are easy to work from home. Um, so by and large, um, we're, we're totally, you know, we're so fortunate and so lucky in so many ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to not like watch the news and feel like a collective, you know, stress and strain and uncertainty. Um, and I know as like an artist, you definitely tap into that a little bit. So Absolutely. it's not to say that I'm like, I'm on vacation, but I'm, um, you know, I'm just sifting through it and trying to see if I can find some purpose in all of this. And, you know, obviously the, when all this started going down, my instinct was to help and try to, you know, it, it's hard as an artist, you know, how can something that you hang on a wall be helpful? But I'm always, my feelers are always out for like, how can I help give back? And for me, I started doing daily paintings on Instagram to maybe just distract or to create like a space for people to just not be in the world for like an hour a day. Um, so that's like my morsel of a contribution, but yeah, and other, I think mostly that's, brilliant. I'm that's really brilliant. You're absolutely right. You're yeah. showing up and you're giving a safe space where you're creating and you're offering people to come in, which I mean, which might not seem like a lot because everyone is uh, on YouTube before this, mm -hmm. But now you know what it's like to sit alone in a room and create, right? And to share that with yeah. people is so powerful. So I'm glad you're doing that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I've been following you on Instagram for a while and I just love the energy of your colors, your brush strokes. <laughs> and it's just, I read your bio and in your bio it says unapologetic. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what it feels like. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about how you stumbled into your practice and see those colors and those brush strokes? Yeah, yeah. Well, to explain the specifically the unapologetic part, um, my Instagram handle is not sorry art, and um, I always liked it because it was twofold. One, it kind of answers like, what is my name? My name is Sari. It's um, spelled S A R I, and I understand that people read that as sorry. I mean, it, I think it makes sense that way. Um, so forever, you know, since kindergarten, you know, teachers read off my name and they, they pronounce it sorry. And so since, gosh, what would that be like? Ninety eight, I've been saying it's sorry, not sorry. <laughs> and um, it was a trend, so I kind of cashed in on it. But it was also something I I decided. I remember when I picked it out, I I was thinking ooh, is this too too sassy or too abrasive? Mm -hmm. And I, I remembered it was something that I did want to cultivate in myself, this like unapologetic, I mean, just this vibe of like being like, I'm bold, I'm out there, I'm making art every day. And sometimes it's silly and sometimes it's, it's lighthearted, but I always want it to be just like unapologetic. So it ended up being like a really like almost divine feeling name choice, even though it's just an Instagram handle. But yeah, that's how the, that's how the name came to be. But um, how my practice came to be, um, well, I went to, to school for art. I um, went to like a private liberal arts school in the Midwest. Um, and I, I had an amazing painting professor. And basically, I took his first class. It was a drawing class. And he just inspired me. And I took every single one of his classes. And so by the time I was a senior, I had taken like a bunch of painting classes. <laughs> wow. um, and I loved it, but I, I just didn't think it was a realistic um, career choice. So I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll be a graphic designer because that's more practical. Um, but as soon as I graduated, my husband got a job in Austin and we, we drove down to Austin to live. And I had a really weird like year and a half. I kind of floundered around jobs. I ended up getting a job where graphic design was a component to it. And um, I remember feeling really uh, just unsatisfied. I remember having the realization that like my lunch break was like my favorite part of the day. Like I just, I, it was so mundane and the work Absolutely. was so, yeah, it was just, it was not fulfilling. And I, I had worked really hard to get into and through college, um, you know, just for a little bit of quick background. I, um, I grew up very low income. Um, and I didn't think I was going to be able to go to college. It just wasn't <laughs> my people, you know, we 
we were managers of fast food restaurants if everything went well. So I, um, I managed to get a running scholarship, which again was also pretty wow. unexpected. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. The only reason I was able to go to college, um, and it was really hard. I had to have a, you know, a fast food job and be a student athlete and make good grades. So college was really hard for me. I didn't, <laughs> you know, it's hard for most people, but, um, I, I worked really, really hard basically to escape poverty and get through college and then for me to get to a place where I kind of felt like I was settling like I just felt like it wasn't acceptable so <laughs> I quit my job um, but it was right around the time I also got pregnant which again like I think there's some divine <laughs> you know universe putting yeah. you in the right place at the right time um, but yeah when my son was two months old I remember um you know, you know how fast a year and a half can go by when you're kind of not doing anything and it's really scary. Um, and I, I just, I determined to make one painting every day. It was January 1st, 2016. And I said, I'm just going to make one thing a day and just see where that takes me. And, um, yeah. And basically it's been kind of a movie montage ever since where I've just been painting and, you know, working really hard at my craft and here I am now. So, you know, it's such an interesting that. thing that you say that you come from limited resources because I find the complete opposite in your work. Your work is just so mm -hmm. full of abundance and color and like this vibrancy that if you wouldn't have told me that story, I don't think I would have connected to that because you're giving so mm. much, you know, like you have so much to give that it just really comes apparent. Um, and your, I love how you share your, your techniques and, and your process and your work because, you know, art on many levels is such a mystery to people, right? Mm. It's like, yeah. Ooh, how, how do I, how do I access that? Or what do I do with a piece of artwork? So when artists demystify <laughs> it, like you do with your sketch, with the layers of paint, uh, it's a really fun process. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you have a very large following where, where you guys mm -hmm. speak about this. How, can you tell me about that? Yeah, I, I, I make it, I try to make it very, um, you know, I, I demystify it on purpose. And the reason is I, I, growing up, I didn't think fine art was for me. I thought it was, you know, highbrow and you had to, you know, there, you had to have something in your brain that made you be able to understand it. And so it felt very like there was a large barrier to it. Um, and then in college, when I learned the techniques, I realized, oh, there's no barriers. You make what you want. Like that. It's as simple as yeah. that. There's no if you can pick up tools and you can make something and you can show it to one human, you've created art and you are on the same, you know, playing field as every other artist before you. So for me, as someone who feels very egalitarian, like that message and idea just resonated with me so deeply. And so when I did start to get a following um, and I started getting comments like, oh, your work's really good. I could never do that. Um, I felt this immediate responsibility to make sure people didn't feel that way. Basically, I just wanted to show people that um, these are steps. And yes, you may be looking at a painting that's very large and ornate and there's skill that goes into it, but it doesn't always like... I want people to not only see my trajectory and my skill set. So like I keep all of my old paintings on my Instagram account so you can scroll back and see me progress. Mm. But I also wanted people to be able to look at my paintings and think there is an entry point. This didn't start out a masterpiece. Um, you know, that there's an underlayer and there's a messy middle. And then finally something starts to come out of it. I don't want people to think that just because they aren't where I'm at, that art isn't for them. And so I feel that to my core and I hope that that comes across to my audience and I wish I could do more. I wish I could, you know, give away everything I learned just like for free and have it be, <laughs> you know, I, I just think art is so vital to being a human that it's such a shame that there is this inherent sense of barrier to entry to art. And it's just, it feels so wrong to me. So if I can chip away at that in any way, like I, sleep better at night <laughs> I love that yeah absolutely it really comes across I think great job on that oh good can you good. tell me a little good. bit about how what your exposure to art was growing up like uh, where did these ideas of like it being highbrow came from or what was your exposure to see on tv what yeah um just you know I think I think I just internalized classism I think I you know I I never went to an art museum um until college and you know I grew up you know, my, my mom would build things and hang them on the wall, like from thrift shops and, you know, just thinking, how can someone pay, you know, $40,000 for something to hang on the wall when you can make something for $10? Like it just, there was just this disconnect of why people would invest. And 
um, you know, I learned more, a lot more about it and I understand now why someone would spend $40,000 on something on your wall. But um, just, I think the price point kind of made it seem out of reach. Sure. And then I remember also in high school, someone having a conversation about how Bob Ross wasn't a real artist. And I, I did not cable growing up. I grew up on PBS. And so I loved Bob Ross. And I remember thinking that there was this guy who was, you know, generous and giving away these techniques. And it seemed so, it felt so right. And for the art world to say, that's not art. Like, I remember having this feeling of like, well, I don't want to have anything to do with art, even though I enjoyed painting and coloring and, you know, sketching. And I was generally an artsy kid. Like I just, I remember feeling like, you know, I liked making stuff, but the art world seemed very like not my cup of tea. Like, I don't know how to. <laughs> I get that. I totally get that. And I mean, and one thing that I've come to learn, cause I totally, uh, I'm, your story totally aligns with mine as far as the thrift shops and being able to create something from nothing. And you're like, well, why would anybody pay for that? Right. But that's what the <laughs> gift is like this. You have this mm -hmm. gift. We have this gift. And we have to kind of offer it, right? And mm -hmm. finding the way to do that is a crazy journey. Um, totally. <laughs> and you said another thing. Um, I mean, there's so much we can unpack in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love Bob Ross as well. And uh, yeah. uh, when you were when you went to the museum in college, what did you see? What do you remember being touched by or moved by? Yeah. I, well, so at this point it was, you know, I had taken college classes and had, I had had art history classes and I had this big, beautiful, you know, $500 textbook at this point. So I was able to look <laughs> at these beautiful paintings and, you know, the internet was a, a full thing. And so I had, you know, fallen with all these photos specifically. I remember Hopper, um, Wayne Tebow, um, the Ashcan artists, Robert Henry, like Sloan. Um, I'd fallen in love with all these artists on paper and I just remember, in person seeing them and like all of a sudden I realized that like they did in fact vibrate way higher than they did on paper and of course like that seems so elementary but you know I I came into art as like a total skeptic again I think it has a lot to do with the classism um, component and like okay why is this worth this much you know why is this painting worth three years of my mom's work like I, I, like, I just didn't get it I thought it was so silly and then I went to a museum and like certain aspects of like why art is so important and why things do deserve the certain respect that they get kind of started to click. I remember, I think I looked at um, one of Monet's paintings. Um, I went to school in Missouri and so Kansas City was a just a quick drive away and they have the Nelson Atkin um, Museum and um, it's a great museum, but they had a lot of um, impressionist work and I remember the colors, even after all these years, like they really did like vibrate on the canvas and I just yeah I mean I was in shock I think I, I just realized how much I don't know how different they could be as opposed to being on a screen or on paper and that really stuck with me <laughs> yeah it's really interesting that you're saying that the colors vibrated because I feel that when I look at your work I see that mm -hmm. and that comes across in the screen so I can't imagine seeing it in person right so yeah. Yeah. another element and the reason why I reached out to you is because I'm doing the Art Support Pledge, which is this great thing that this artist in um, in the UK started. And basically to keep the energy flowing and to support each other in our community, just the artists in the, in the world, really. Uh, mm -hmm. Artists will create a small series of work that's priced moderately so people can afford it. And once you reach $1,000, you are supposed to, you pledge to buy someone else's mm -hmm. work. And awesome. I achieved my goal. I made a thousand dollars, and now Yay, I congratulations. thank you. Yeah, it's, it was <laughs> so awesome. exciting. It was such a great journey. Yeah. And sure. I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have two hundred dollars to support and to buy art. I'm like, whoa, right? Like, how easy is that? Let's go shopping. Yeah. And can oh, I yeah. tell you, it was, it's been kind of hard. <laughs> it's been kind yeah. of hard because we're very mysterious when it comes to the business mm -hmm. of art. So I'm looking mm -hmm. through Instagram because that's how I do most of my business. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I like this. But there's no information about how much it costs. There's no information about how to go about buying it. And I, I mean, I've been guilty of that all of my life up to very recently. So I, I, sure. I, I totally understand it. When I saw your work, there was a bridge. There was like an entry point. <laughs> You're like, okay, this is art. Oh, yeah. This is how much it costs. You can have this. And and I was, yeah. I was like, whoa, yes, it's, she's so on it. How did you reconcile the art and the business? How did that happen? Was that natural for you? Yeah, I, I think, 
honestly, I think some of it is just um, me being naive to the whole art world thing um, a little bit. So I don't want to claim that it was like super thought out or anything like that. I mean, I definitely I enjoy, you know, looking into marketing. I think out of all the aspects of business, like marketing and stuff is like my favorite. It's the most creative to me. Um, and so there is a little bit of thought that goes into it. But um, yeah, I I mean, I just didn't know how like coy the art world could be and how um I don't know, again, unapproachable. Like I, you know, growing up, like we, it would, it was unthinkable to buy, to like even in, like entertain the idea of buying something you didn't know the price for. We budgeted down to literal change growing up. And so for me, it just, I've never, like, I, I don't even think I've understood how to play the whole, you know, you only sell this much and you have to go through a buyer. And I'm just generally not interested in that. I, I think that, um, I like the connection I have with my audience. I think social media is changing how we use galleries and how buyers work. And I, I think, you know, in a way to honor my, my customers and my clientele and my fans, like I owe it to them to be pretty transparent. And so (laughs) for me, it's more of a, like, maybe it's like the Midwestern in me, but I I just feel like I just want to be an open, transparent business owner. And like, I know I'm an artist first, but if I have an e-commerce site, I'm also a business owner. And so I, I guess I've just never thought too much about it. I just said, this is how I'm going to run it. And my prices will increase as I get better. And that makes sense to me. But um, I'm also not going to be weird with it either. I just want to be transparent and open. And I'm glad that comes across because like, I put a lot of energy into trying to make things pretty open and transparent and user friendly. It's so. brilliant. And I think you hit it on the nail when you, when you said, I don't want to be weird. Cause I think, you know, a lot of artists are taught to take pride in the weird and be like, no, you, you know, be mysterious, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> wear black. <laughs> so it's, it's great that you sure. have totally yeah, yeah. taken that block off, you know, and it kind of totally goes, right. it, it totally kind of goes with the energy of your handle. Right. Sorry, not sorry. Yeah, <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, I know I'm probably doing things like incorrectly or not, you know, in line with the art world. But I I feel like just like ethically, it sits well with me. And maybe I'll learn and change. And I always leave room for that. But um, yeah, I, I don't care. I, I feel like if I'm if I'm not doing things in line with the art world, it's not because I'm being like weird or shifty. Like, it just feels right to me. And, um, you know, and I, I hope that like other artists who come along, know that there's other business models and you don't have to play this weird guessing game and like you have to know the right people that you can just run it like an e-commerce business. Um, And it kind of takes the mysteriousness out of selling your artwork. It's again, another barrier to entry. It's this feeling of like, oh, what don't I know? What what wasn't I taught? Like, is my lack of education keeping me from being able to participate in this? So, yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. And it's really interesting, especially I think now in this time of pandemic that everything, Mm -hmm. we have to kind of go back to the drawing board. I feel that artists okay. that are open in, in this sense um, are kind of landing on their feet because not only do they know how to be alone, not only do they know how to deal with emotions or, yeah. or uh, the reality of life, but also if you know how to have an ask with your offering, then you're set. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's such an important thing I, I, I've realized with artists that this is like our opportunity to like open up and really connect with people because people want, it's a captive audience, <laughs> you know, everyone's sure, at home yeah. and yeah. people really need what we have to offer. You know, I, I think Absolutely. it's really important. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. What is moving you right now? How do you, how are you staying inspired in this moment? What are you watching? What are you listening to? Yeah. Um, yeah, I had, so when, when quarantine first kind of kicked in, um, I I remember the first thing I jumped to, the only thing that made sense to me because I, you know, I had been following it since like January and it like, you know, I was very anxious about it. Um, the only thing that made sense when we kind of officially shut down and everyone was like scared and un- unsure um, was I was like, you know what, I think I think my place that I can maybe help a little bit is to hop on Instagram live and talk to people and paint and like, I made sure not to talk about (laughs) coronavirus and Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that it was a place where um, people could escape and maybe they could learn some art tips. And, um, you know, so I I plugged into that. I was really consistent in the beginning. I've kind of fallen off just because we've moved a little bit. But um, but that for me felt like the right thing to do. Um, And I'm glad I had that. Like that seems like I'm being like, oh, so selfless. But it actually was really helpful to me because I 
really felt like I lacked motivation everywhere else because of the same reason everyone else was struggling. Like I'm not immune to that. I am very fortunate in that. Like my husband is able to work from home and I obviously work from home. My studio is in my house. Um, and so like largely I'm unaffected, but I still, as a collective person and as someone who's, you know, I'm definitely like a sensitive person. Like I, I just, you know, it's a collective trauma. I think we're all going through this. And so I really struggled with my own personal body of work. Um, And so I plugged into making these kind of lighter, one-off, like teaching paintings, um, because it didn't require a lot of thought, but it it enabled me to be able to help. And so I felt, it scratched an itch. It basically was like, I was able to be of service, but I didn't have to dive deep, which I I just don't think I could, could, especially the first like month, I just like, I couldn't do it. recently I've sort of settled into a new normal and again I feel dramatic even saying that because like the day-to-day isn't dramatically different for me but um I think I've learned how how and where to take in the information and then where to plug in and pick up my creative practice again like it was before the pandemic um and so I (laughs) It's actually, it's been really interesting. So to see how the the coronavirus has affected um, different people groups and so poor people of color. um, For me, I, a lot of my account is very light and fluffy and you would think that that's like me being evasive or something, but a, a lot of my practice up until this point has just been like a practice of gratitude. Like it's just been like, I'm grateful to be alive and be out of poverty and out of trauma Um, But recently I've started to feel a call to maybe speak to my roots and maybe make something of that. Like, I think I've processed it enough that I can like take it on a little bit more. Um, And so I have a series that I took right before the shutdown happened in Springfield, Missouri, my hometown. And it's like of the neighborhoods I grew up in. And so basically I'm picking that back up, but I feel like with our new normal, like it makes more sense to me and I have more purpose in that series, if that makes sense. So What am I doing to fuel that um, therapy? <laughs> um, I'm reading a lot of books on like class and, you know, things like that. And then, you know, just taking in the news and stuff. That's so, so powerful. Yeah. That's so powerful that you're saying, you know, that, that you're making these beautiful fluff pieces. You, you would, someone, mm-hmm. If you see it on the surface, um, but now you feel a calling to address, right? So mm-hmm. I'm a person of color and I'm, yeah. I'm queer and... You know, I don't always address these things because I have learned, and this is my personal experience, I've learned that there's always a fight. There's always a struggle, yeah. right? And it's it's yeah. like, I can't bear with it. So I like I figured, <laughs> yeah. like, you know what? I decided a long time ago, I'm not going to fight. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to find people to support, to support yeah. to, and elevate, you know? And I, I think yeah. on many levels, that's what we're doing with art, that's what we're doing with podcasting, when we show up on Instagram Live. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I totally feel that. It's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sunday is mm-hmm. Mother's Day, and you're yeah. you're a mom, right? What's that like? Totally. Yeah, that's it's fun. It's a, it's a good balance <laughs> with art. I I love it. I you know the whole reason I was able to even start my whole art career was because I was on maternity leave, wow. and so I have a lot of like love and compassion towards being a mom and how it intertwines with art. You know, I I see all these statistics on paper about how, like, um, you know, when a woman becomes a mother, her career takes a dive. And that's a pretty much across the board phenomenon um, where men's careers um, tend to they get paid more when they have children. And so there's a lot of like it's weird to me. There's such a disconnect. I there's so much out there that says even within the art world that to be a woman and to further, you know, to be a mom and cast into the motherhood niche, it should be a bad thing like somehow that like takes away from my consistency or I'm less desirable to invest in as an artist like I get all this information but like in truth like I feel like being a mom has made me a better artist all around like I just feel like on every front um you know sure maybe I have less time but I'm more purposeful with my time than I was before and um it's having a child has forced me to slow down and take in nature and like tell me an artist that that's not good for like it's there's so much that being a mom has has helped me with and really give me a more robust practice so I have this weird like on paper I should I should be struggling with this but in real life like you know sure it requires more planning but like it's been like the best way I can describe it is you know when you're being when you're busy all day doing mom stuff like going and sitting in the studio is like the best break from that or when you're in the studio and you're frustrated going and sitting and playing uno with a four-year-old is like the best break for that like it's just 
they're such a beautiful, you know, compliment to each other that I, I love it. And, you know, I'm pregnant with our second. And, Yay, um, congratulations. Last time. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, we're due in August 5th is the due date. So, wow, yeah, it's coming out. But, beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm excited. Of course, I'm nervous because, you know, the first few months you, you, you have less time. But I, um, I'm launching a curriculum in, in uh, August. And so... I'm kind of putting a lot of energy into that. And then um, I'm also excited to get back to like watercolors and different stuff. So I, I'm excited for the change. I mean, I think as an artist, the more manageable <laughs> curveballs you're thrown, the better. And so I, I'm just open and excited to see how I'm going to adjust. And, you know, I've, I've been in life. So I'm hoping that something, you know, really interesting and beautiful comes out of this new challenge. So. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you just dropped so many secrets for people who are listening to this and they're, you know, because we're, we're fed all these lies, really. Like, oh, yeah. you, you know, you're a woman, don't have babies. You're queer, you know, yeah. make a certain type of art. You're this, stay right. home. And the truth of the matter is that it's, it really depends on your narrative and how you decide to, to live it out, right? So Absolutely. if you can project yourself to maybe 10 years from now, 20 years from now, where would you mm. like to be with your art career and your family? Yeah, I, I think about that a lot, actually. I, you know, I think that that's what helped me. I hate to keep calling back to this, but get out of poverty as I was always living yes. 10 years ahead of myself. I yes. think that that's, you know, a tool I've used, a superpower even. Um, yeah, I would love to, on two fronts, I, you know, on the actual art practice front, I hope that I'm making you know, really smart art that's like, it doesn't lose its humor or its ability to make fun of itself, but it's also give, you know, I'm excited to see where my brain is in 10 years, that if I keep learning and keep opening myself up and humbling myself, that like, I'm excited to see where that Sari is. Um, and then as far as like bigger goals, um, I don't know if this is more of a 30, 40 year goal, but actually in my life, I would love to um, you know, I, I use sports as a way to get out of poverty, like the running. Um, and that seems to be a, a track for people who aren't typically college bound to get out. And so I would love if somehow art could fill that gap. Like, I don't understand why it doesn't like why it can't. There's so many resources. Um, there's so much education out there. And like, it costs pretty minimal to start an e-commerce business. And then more importantly than that, the trauma that comes with poverty, a lot of that can be healed with a creative practice. And so for me, I would love to be a part of something, start something, I'm not really sure, but that uses art and a creative practice to pull people out of poverty and to get them, you know, their trauma healed and to get them believing in themselves and participating in a way that maybe financially heals them. So I don't know exactly what that looks like. I'm, I'm a big ideas person, <laughs> but I think, I think that that's somewhere where my calling is. So yeah, I don't know. Take with that what you will. It's, I it's appreciate lofty, but. <laughs> that so much. Yeah, what an exciting future. I love that. And, and it's, I mean, yeah. I think it's so important to know your mission. And it's not like you know your mission. And we know, I mean, when you know what's pulling you and the reasons you're doing things, nothing can stop you, really. You know, so it's really yeah. exciting. Now, are you still a sports person? Yeah, well, I mean, I was, it's funny. I've never been like t a typical sports. I couldn't care less about the you know, the sports side of running, but I'm still a runner. I, I, I walk now because I'm, um, almost my third trimester, but wow. yeah, I getting out and like just clearing my head. I mean, I always, that's like, that's like my medicine. Like I, right. I really need it. It grounds me. It centers me. And so I, I still love being active and, you know, working out, but yeah, my, my daily walks and runs, I usually do about an hour a day or still like very much part of my life. So I owe so much to it. I feel like I almost like I can't break up with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea. Yeah, that's yeah. a great concept. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> well, Sari, thank you so much for uh, showing up and talking with me and yeah. sharing your story. I am thrilled that I am going to buy it part of your work and, and have it with oh, me yay. <laughs> and have that energy with me in my house. And I look forward to seeing more of what you do. So we'll be yeah, cheering you on you so from much. New York. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for having me on here. It was really fun. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so then I'll stop there and then I'll, I'll okay, edit. Cool. But that was fantastic. Um, yeah.